Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about the disappearance of 14-year-old Alice Gross, a beautiful and talented young girl from a loving family who went for a walk by the canal on a bright summer's day. She was captured on camera and seen by eyewitnesses. And yet, in the blink of an eye, she had vanished. Murder Marley's research used an authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 120, The Yellow Ribbons of Hanwell, Part 1. Today, I'm standing on the towpath of the Grand Union Canal, 11 miles west of the severed pieces of Paula Fields, eight miles west of the suitcase of Marta Lickman, six miles north of the Thames Topath murders, and two and a half miles east of the family of Amarjit Chohan. Coming soon to Murder Mile. This is the Hanwell Flight, a series of locks on the most southerly stretch of the Grand Union Canal, giving steady passage for boats. Beginning high on the hill at South Hall, dropping down past three bridges, along the back of the old Hanwell Asylum, past Lock Cottage, Brentford Weir, Trumpers Bridge, Elthorn and Boston Manor Parks, and ending at the basement of Brentford Gaging Lock and the River Thames beyond. Stuck at the far end of West London, but technically Middlesex, this is a popular place for dog walkers, joggers and strollers, seeking a lungful of fresh air as well as cyclists avoiding the trucks and buses of the surrounding roads. Being part rural and part industrial, it's mostly a muddy towpath which skirts the descending canal, with bushes on both sides and a few secluded side paths every half a mile or so. It may sound idyllic, being blessed with chirping coots, splashing fishes and a bright red blur as foxes dart amongst the thicket But this peace is often drowned out by the roar of traffic, the chug of chimneys, the crunch of scrapyards, and the panicked slip as the most cautious of walkers trips on broken bricks and bike parts, only to narrowly miss the stinky bin bags bobbing in the brown water. If you ignore all of that, it's actually quite nice. Lock 97 on the Hanwell flight is unremarkable. Set halfway between three bridges and the Thames, it's an anonymous lock and it acts as the junction between the canal and the River Brent. Every day, people pass by and ignore this seemingly insignificant little spot as the only hint of the truly abhorrent crime which once took place here is a small handmade memorial to a loving girl so tragically lost. As it was here, on Thursday the 28th of August 2014, at roughly 4.34pm, that 14-year-old Alice Cross passed this spot on her walk. And yet having passed it for a second time, she vanished. On Valentine's Day, at the turn of the new millennium, Alice Poppy Madeline Gross was born. A tiny dot with light brown hair and porcelain skin, punctuated by a big beaming set of baby blue eyes. And as much as Alice would grow from toddler to her teenage years, she would always be petite, doll-like and delicate. But as the epitome of sweetness and joy, 
she was always protected and encouraged by her eternally loving family. Her mum, Rosalind, her father, Jose, and her older sister, Nina. Having moved to Hanwell, a small ancient town at the most westerly point of Ealing, the Gross family thrived in this tight-knit community. It's a good place, full of family-run shops, churches and schools, being surrounded by acres of parkland and rivers, and host to London's oldest carnival. For Alice, Hanwell was her home, and a place she felt safe. Described as sweet and beautiful, as she entered her early teens, Alice was smaller than most, being a mere five foot and two inches tall and weighing barely six stone. And although her youthful looks were compounded by her elfin-like features, raised well, she had a wise head on her tiny shoulders. With a solid group of friends, Alice was bubbly, well-liked and loyal, with a happy-go-lucky personality. She was never any trouble and enjoyed her independence, but was conscious of her safety. As a loving daughter, she was helpful, polite, and would always text her parents to tell them where she was. At no time in the past had she run away from home, and she never would, as her home life was good. Creatively, alongside her artistic sister, she was blessed with a musical gift. Having learned the violin, the piano, and soon the ukulele, having spent many a fond hour with her father on the guitar, and aided by her beautiful singing voice, she wrote and performed her own songs. As a student, two years from her GCSEs, she attended Brentside High School on Greenford Avenue. And although her uniform of a black skirt and blazer white blouse and tie was always neat. Keen to express herself, occasionally she broke the dress code with a splash of eyeliner, hair dye, and a stud in her ear perched a little bit higher than the school found acceptable. But find a teenager who hadn't. Above all, she was good, conscientious, and keen to do well, having excelled in all of her subjects. Alice was a classic teenager. She thrived to be individual, yet accepted by her peers. She was sociable, yet often glued to her iPhone, as she updated her every thought on Facebook, Twitter and AskFM. And with her body blossoming into womanhood, she was struggling with depression and anorexia. By her 14th year, weighing just 40 kilos, Alice ate very little and exercised a lot. And although it was a difficult time, she was on course to succeed with her illness, being blessed with a loving family. And then, on a summer's day, in broad daylight, for no reason whatsoever, Alice Gross vanished. Twenty fourteen was a good summer. Being warm and dry, with odd flashes of the good old British drizzle, the school holidays had begun with Hanwell's annual carnival. Broadway was packed with cheering families as the procession passed Hanwell Clock Tower. There was live music, a bouncy castle, a dog show, a petting zoo, and as a multicultural area, there was Polish dancing, a kabaddi tournament and food stalls from around the world. By the end of August, the fun had tailed off. The weather was still good, but with the holidays ending and the schools due back in a week, everyone, whether a parent or pupil, was stuck in a dreary malaise. For the Gross family, it was an ordinary week. Jose was at work. As a teacher, Rosalind was preparing her paperwork, and Alice and her sister were savouring the last days of freedom before the new term. Thursday the 28th of August 2014 was as unremarkable as any other day. 
being 23 degrees Celsius, sunny but not hot, and calm with a light breeze. It was the perfect weather for a long walk. Dressed in dark blue skinny jeans, a black v-neck t-shirt and white socks, Alice tightly laced up her blue canvas van trainers, popped on her purple framed glasses, and into her black van's backpack, crisscrossed with a stylish flash of purples, greens and blues, which purposely matched her jogging outfit. She packed a Tupperware box of snacks, a change of knickers, and her half-charged iPhone. At 12.50pm, having told her mum that she'd be back by 4pm, Alice left the family home, on a walk she had done many times before. Only this time was the last time. Like any town, the streets of Hanwell were half full as Alice crossed Church Road. Being an elfin-like Dot, although short and skinny, she strode with a steady pace and confident stance of a determined girl whose exercise wasn't part of her pastime, but part of her battle with anorexia. And as she power walked into Campbell Road, her shoulder length ponytail swung pendulously behind her. At 1.05 pm, Alice and her recognizable walking style was spotted on CCTV as she headed west past Hanwell Station. She wasn't followed. She didn't stop, and she wouldn't make any detours. She strolled up Golden Manor, along Alwyn Road, and followed the River Brent past the Warncliffe Viaduct. At 1.13pm, a traffic camera caught Alice crossing Hanwell Bridge on the busy Uxbridge Road. Had she continued south along this craggy path beside the River Brent, this pleasant leafy shortcut would have got her to Lock 97 on the Grand Union Canal within five minutes. But Alice wanted to get the miles in. So she headed west, up the Uxbridge Road, past Ealing Hospital, and turned left into Windmill Lane. At 1.26pm, CCTV recorded Alice entering the Hanwell flight at Three Bridges. She was alone, her speed was solid, and she showed no sense of fear or worry. As this stretch of the towpath was evenly paved and moderately busy. It wasn't crammed, but wherever she was, there would always be a jogger, a cyclist, and a dog walker in sight. Passing the back of the old Hanwell Asylum, now home to Ealing Hospital, Alice began her descent with a canal on the right, bushes on the left, and never deviating from the path for three miles. She passed Lock Cottage at Lock 97, the siphon, a wooden bridge over the Brent Weir, and with the path becoming uneven and littered with trip hazards, her average speed had dropped to three miles an hour. At 1.45 p.m., a camera caught her passing under the Trumpers Way Bridge as she followed a preset route past familiar sites like Elthorne Park, Osterley Lock, the M4 Flyover, and Boston Manor Park. She crossed over the canal at Gallows Bridge, strode down past Transport Avenue and several industrial estates. She continued under the Great West Road, the Piccadilly Line at Brentford Bridge, past the impressive glass buildings of Glatso Smith Klein and Sky Studios, and into the basin at Brentford Lock. At 2.23 p.m., two cameras at Canute House and the Holiday Inn captured Alice crossing a short black and white footbridge at Brentford Gaging Lock, having walked five miles in roughly 90 minutes. At this point, either she strode east on the high street towards Kew Bridge, walked beside the Thames towpath at Brentside, or rested at Brentford Lock whilst watching the ducks, coots and narrowboats. What is known is that at a little after 3pm, having changed her plans, which was not unusual for Alice, she texted her dad. 
like a good girl, she told him she was extending her walk and she would meet him at 6 p.m. when he returned home. Alice's return journey was the mirror opposite of the route she had just walked. The day was still bright and sunny, the towpath was moderately busy, and it would soon be filled with commuters on bicycles. At 3.45pm, once again, Alice was caught on CCTV at Brentford Lock, heading north. At 3.56pm, a camera at GlaxoSmithKline spotted her passing under the Great West Road. At 4.02pm, CCTV spotted her opposite Transport Avenue. She passed the parks, the locks, the M4 flyover, and crossed over Gallows Bridge. Her speed was good, her demeanour was calm, and as before, there were no obvious signs of fear. At 4.23pm, the last of three cyclists rode under the camera at the Trumpers Way Bridge. With Alice passing just three minutes later, and heading north towards the junction of the Hanwell Flight and the River Brent. At that speed, she would have left the canal at three bridges 19 minutes later. But she didn't. She didn't enter Windmill Lane. She didn't pass Ealing Hospital. She didn't detour into either of the parks which were all behind her and the traffic camera at Hanwell Bridge didn't capture her walking east on the Uxbridge Road or north of the Brent River via the overgrown shortcut at Lock 97. Somehow, between 4.23pm and 4.42pm, on a small clear stretch of the canal, Alice Gross had vanished. At 5pm, her phone was still active and pinging off the masts. By 6pm, she was late and missing her dad's home-cooked dinner. With her phone dead and redirecting to voicemail, her worried parents called her closest friends, but no one had seen her. So by 7pm, being concerned, they called the police. Contrary to belief, a child doesn't need to be missing for 24 hours before the police will come out. A missing child is a high priority, especially one so punctual who had never gone missing before. Arriving that evening, officers took a description, a photo, and circulated her details to the local bobbies on the lookout for Alice. As with any missing person, they checked her usual haunts, the hospitals, and made house-to-house -house inquiries. But it all drew a blank, and her social media accounts were silent. Although she had packed snacks, as a skinny, frail girl who battled anorexia, it was feared that she may have collapsed somewhere along her walk. Although she had left home in her usual bubbly mood, suffering with depression, it seemed likely, but logical, that Alice may have ran away. As like many teenagers with raging hormones, she may have been secretly stressed over peer pressure, bullying, or boyfriends. None of which seemed like Alice, who was so thoughtful, loving, and kind. But it had to be considered. By the morning of Monday the 1st of September 2014, Alice had been missing for four days. But for her family, who hadn't seen or heard a single word from her, those were the longest days of their lives. That day, the Gross family and the Met Police launched an appeal to find Alice. Across every media, her mum addressed her daughter, pleading, 
you may have been going through a tough time. But we remember a lot of the happier family times that we shared together, and we're really looking forward to sharing more of those. We miss you, and we love you. We miss your laughter and smile. And we just want you to come home and to know that you're safe. Alongside the appeals, they set up a Find Alice Facebook group and Twitter handle. Missing persons posters adorned every street across Hanwell and the wider borough of Ealing. And symbolic of the warmth and joy, this sunshine of a girl brought to those who knew her. Bright yellow ribbons were fixed to every possible gatepost and railing as a daily and even hourly reminder to find Alice. With every ribbon tied and every poster put up, the Gross family and the people of Hanwell had hope. But one clue would escalate this missing persons case to something more serious. On Tuesday the 2nd of September, Alice's black backpack was found. Out for a walk before sunset, a couple had spotted it at 8.15pm on the day she went missing, but they didn't know its significance till now. It was dumped amongst the leafy undergrowth of the overgrown shortcut between Lock 97 and the Hanwell Bridge. Her purse and iPhone were missing, her spare underpants and the lunchbox were in place. But most unnervingly of all, inside were her blue canvas trainers, the pair she was wearing that day. By Thursday the 4th of September, Alice had been missing for a week, but the search went on. That day, the police released CCTV footage of Alice confidently power walking past Brentford Gaging Lock at 2.23pm and 3.45pm, hoping to jog people's memories of this very recognisable girl with a very specific walk. The search for Alice Gross would become the Met Police's largest deployment of police resources since the 7-7 bombings. Over 600 officers and sniffer dogs searched 10 square miles of ponds, parks and marshes most of which consisted of dense woodland, tangled thickets, and endlessly soggy bogs. Being interconnected with roads, rails, and industrial estates, the search area was frequently littered with items lost by walkers, like shoes, clothes, or phones, as well as bin bags, bricks, and broken bits of bike, which lay deliberately hidden under old scraps of carpet, or were secreted amongst some impenetrable nettles by lazy fly tippers, so that so many potential pieces of evidence turned out to be nothing. Divers from the police marine unit conducted a painstaking fingertip search of three and a half miles of rivers, the canal, weirs and side ponds, with some stretches of the Grand Union Canal being up to 50 feet wide and 10 feet deep. With visibility so poor in the silty water, they couldn't see their own hands. Vast swathes of overgrown vegetation were cut back to aid the search as they cleared a path from three bridges, Lock 97 and Hanwell Bridge, all the way down to Trumpers Way, Gallows Bridge and Brentford Lock. Hundreds of tons of nettles and rubbish removed from head height to the riverbed. Everywhere was checked. As helicopters scoured the skies, cadaver dogs sniffed the soil, police cadets patrolled in packs, experts were requisitioned, metal detectors were perpetually pinging, and even the Royal Air Force provided aerial analysis to pinpoint patches of earth which had recently been disturbed. The investigation team followed 729 lines of inquiry, questioned 1,064 people, and a team of 30 detectives scoured more than 10,000 hours of CCTV footage from 300 cameras across a six square mile area, totaling 35 terabytes worth of images. Across the weeks, they were able to piece together most of her journey, 
as well as identifying five cyclists on the towpath shortly before she disappeared. Alice's mother Rosalind would later state, every morning, as Alice's disappearance grows longer, it brings new agony, new anguish. And as everybody knew, the longer the search took, the less chance they had of finding her alive, and the more forensic evidence would be destroyed. But after 4.23 p.m., as she passed Trumper's Way Bridge, there were no more sightings of Alice. And then, after 33 days of nothing, a body was found. Based on the CCTV footage, police had narrowed the search to just north of the Trumpers Way Bridge, south of Three Bridges and east of the Hanwell Bridge. And utilising specialist search teams with more advanced equipment and greater techniques, they rechecked the areas they had checked before. On Tuesday the 30th of September, at around 7pm, police cordoned off the towpath at Lock 97, and to the left of Lock Cottage, a secluded and overgrown shortcut leading to Hanwell Bridge, running alongside the River Brent, and barely a few hundred feet from where her black backpack had been found. With no hint of spoiled earth or disturbed vegetation, this little-known nook, barely eight feet and always within sight of the canal's towpath, looked as untouched as it had one month before. The body was so well hidden, even experienced search teams and the cadaver dogs had missed her. And London Fire Brigade, with their specialist equipment, had to be called in to excavate the remains. Whoever had buried her there needed to make sure that she would never be found. Behind a tree, down a slope, under a bush, and buried in three feet of silty water, the tiny pale frame of a young girl's body had been pinned to the riverbed of the River Brent. Wrapped in black bin bags, laying in a fetal position, and stripped naked except for a single white sock, her short skinny body had been weighed down by four house bricks tied to a bicycle wheel. And on top, this had been secured in place by a two foot long, 20 kilo log, almost half her body weight, so that nothing would drift up. A formal identification was made the next day, where her parents confirmed it was Alice. The autopsy was conducted on Thursday the 2nd of October at West London Mortuary by Dr. Ashley Fagan Earl. Badly decomposed, after 33 days in the water, initial tests proved inconclusive, but later the following were confirmed. Alice had been attacked on or near the towpath. She had died shortly after her disappearance. The motive was sexual, and her cause of death was compression asphyxia to the torso. Meaning, being just a small girl of just six stone in weight, her tiny chest had been crushed, suffocated of all its oxygen, as a man, almost twice her own weight, had bared down upon her and raped her. In a statement, Alice's parents said, We have been left completely devastated. It is difficult to comprehend that our sweet and beautiful daughter was the victim of a terrible crime. Why anyone would want to hurt her is something we are still struggling to come to terms with. We still don't know who is responsible for this crime and we ask that people continue to help the police to bring the perpetrator to justice. We would like to thank all of those who have supported us in our efforts to find Alice, 
especially the local community, it is comforting to know that so many people care. The locals were left devastated, many of whom had helped in the search for this missing girl. Only now, it had become a murder investigation. Like a little ray of sunshine, the yellow ribbons of Hanwell, which still stood proudly on every gatepost and railing, as a reminder of the sunshine that Alice's warmth had brought, and as a symbol of hope that one day she may return home safe. Only now, they acted as a memorial to the dead, as a black cloud hung over Hanwell, and a child killer stalked their midst. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. The concluding part of the Yellow Ribbons of Hanwell continues next week. If you'd like to learn a little more about this case, as well as to join me for a birthday cup of tea, we can do that after the break. But before that, here's a brief promo for a true crime podcast which may be right up your street. Hi, I'm Jenny the host of It's Murder Up North. If you're curious about the murderous north of England, this podcast is definitely for you. I've lived in various parts of the north of England. I went to college in the shadow of Saddleworth Moor, where Myra Hindley and Ian Brady buried those five innocent children. I've worked in the city of Leeds, where the Yorkshire Ripper targeted his victims in the 1970s. Knowing how geographically close I have been to these crimes made me curious and that curiosity became this podcast. However, my main hope is to help you see the person, not the victim. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, many of whom joined us a good few weeks ago, so I apologise for the delay. They are Karen Hillier, Dawn Hansford, Kelly Keeslier, Donna Stevens, Lee Cullen, Bev Jones, Frankie Watt, Neil Crew, Charlotte Lilly, Steve Perkins, Anne Marie Cummins, Joe Rayson, Kay Fillmore, Kirsty McGinty, Jan Hole, Laura Knight, and Andrew Duncan. I hope I've got those names right. To those I didn't, I apologize. And as this list is pretty big, I'll be continuing it next week. But I hope all of you enjoyed your goodies, as well as walk with me. Plus a thank you to everyone who has very kindly sent a donation via the supporter app or the Murder Mile eShop. They were Roland Varga, Frank Pinter, Craig Baldwin, Ruth, Poppy the Dog, Dez, an anonymous American friend, Jojo, and Sumima. I thank all of you. That's very generous. Murder Mile was researched, written, and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Cool, lummy, it's been a while since I've done one of those. Going to move the big uh, uh, protective screen out of the way. Cool, I couldn't even remember how to set up my... Uh, laptop this morning oh I, I, I oh dear and then it was like i trying to remember where i where i put my microphone not where i put my microphone but where i normally put it on my desk what height to have it because it's kind of it's on a box and then the laptop's on another box and then you know it's it's a small space so i have to try and get everything right and then it was like i was like god where do i put everything does it sound right what's my settings on my laptop what's the setting on the on the recording app Oh dear, I had, to, I had to sit down and double check everything. And now half of me is thinking, yeah, I did have the right settings. I think we will find out when I get moving. So welcome to Extra Mile, everyone. We're back. We're back for um, season five of uh, of Murder Mile. And yes, to uh, those podcasts which are made by Wondery or, or any of those ones, a season is not six to eight episodes. It's a year's worth that's that's a season a season should be about 30 40 
50 episodes whatever it should not be six to eight i think that's an insult to call that a season that's that's a series really uh anyway uh uh is it tea time yeah i'm gonna just go pop on a, cu- a couple of tea cup of tea is there water in there i haven't even checked see this is out out of practice i am i've forgotten to set up me uh my kettle to make sure i've got enough water in there uh Pop of tea on. Oh, make sure it's on. Yep. Bit of sugar. Uh, even though it is winter, uh, I haven't really got. I, I've got. I've got a kind of almond milk in the fridge, which is good for cereal, but it's not really good for tea. I find it goes a bit curdly. So I've been enjoying those. I've been having. I, I had uh, the salt, the almond milk, which is okay, uh, and then I had. I think I'm on the soya one at the moment. I did try a hemp uh, milk before, and I just found it a bit... It was a bit tart. A bit tart. Um, so, uh, let's let's whiz in some stuff while, while, the, while the kettle's on. So, uh, just, just so you know, uh, this start... Uh, I know some people will, will be like, oh, the start's not as funny as it thought it was be. It wasn't as funny. You didn't say willy and bum. Uh, I... I I deliberately made a conscious effort not for the start not to be that funny cause I do find that if it's too funny it unsettles a lot of things I've had a couple of people get in touch go oh, I really enjoyed this episode uh, uh, but quite rightly sometimes if it's too if it's too funny it throws off the whole episode and because this murder case is is if you think about it it's, in, it's 2014 so it's only seven years ago it's just gone the anniversary of Poppy's uh alice's uh a birthday which was valentine's day uh so that you know the family do you know if i'm doing a case from the 1940s it's not too bad but if it's a case from just seven years ago do you know the family is still grieving so uh they they might and probably will stumble across this episode and what i didn't want to do is have do you know uh oh here's a location oh bum willies all oh, references to dog turds it's like it just it throws it off I, I i i know people enjoy it but it's that kind of it's it's that bit that i find it really jars with me it's something i started a, a long time ago and then it got worse it got silly and it just oh i, I just feel it ruins the episode but and especially for here families are gonna uh, be listening to this episode so um so the start to this is deliberately deliberately not funny uh consciously uh and i think what i'm going to start doing is 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 making them a little bit more going back to the old way i used to do which is making them more sarcastic as opposed to just trying to cram in something funny so uh uh tease up uh there we go i'll probably do my usual i'll probably let it sit and then I'll forget about it, and then I'll go back to my tea when it's gone cold, as I always do. There we go. Right, let's whiz through some stuff. I'm probably not. I'm probably not going to do too much about the the uh, Alice's stuff because I've put a lot into this episode, uh, and uh, I put a lot of the information about this case into the episode. And also, as this is a two parter, and I've still got to write part two next week, uh, I don't want to kind of. I don't want to ruin a lot of things that I, I that I've deliberately left out or I've teased you with in this episode. Uh, there's lots of as I always do. If there's multi-parters, there's I always tease you. I always put bits in part one and bits in part two. And if it's multi-parter, I kind of space it out so you kind of get bits and pieces here and there. So uh, we'll 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 dip into something shortly. So what's been going on? Uh, we oh god, I've been away a while, haven't we? Uh, so we did Christmas. That was good. That was good fun. I got to have a good couple of days off. I had my, I treated myself to a big uh, 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 Chinese takeaway, which was my end of year treat because obviously kind of a Christmas do because I work by myself and because of COVID. So I had a Christmas, uh, a China, big Chinese takeaway, which was my treat. It cost me about 45 quid. Uh, I had ended up having Chinese takeaway for three meals. So that was dinner, breakfast, lunch dinner and i thought oh yeah i think i do i think i had one in between i might have, actually know i had two dinners on the first night so yeah i was really struggling after that and then that was good and then we had christmas day and amy came along thank you very much amy that was good fun uh so neither of us could go come home so uh we uh 
I, I technically don't have a bubble, so Amy became my bubble. It was fine, everyone. Do you know, we said bubble. You know that's a secret. Uh, you know that COVID can't get you if you say bubble. Bubble, bubble, we my bubble, bubble, bubble. Oh, I'm going to the pub with all my 50 mates. It's all right, they're in my bubble. COVID can't get me, it's in my bubble. So uh, that was good fun. We uh, ate lots of food. We drank lots of booze. I was good. I didn't have my. I didn't have a drink until two p two p.m., which is weird. I I thought to myself, I can't turn up. Alice, uh, Alice, oh dear, uh, Amy can't turn up and have me uh, arsehole already. So I actually waited, which is a miracle. But therefore, I had I had hundreds of beers that I'd stocked up, and it took me till the end of January to finish drinking. Uh, hence, I'm on a strict diet now because I I was sitting on the bed and I realised I'd gone panda shaped which is not good. Uh, I'd picked out on too much chocolate. Literally, I treated myself out. So I'm on a strict diet now. So uh, no cake. No, ch- I haven't had chocolate since, since, well, since I finished off the big tub of roses in the middle of January. So that's like a month. I haven't had bickies, which has been good. I do occasionally treat myself to a cake, but I always make sure that I've done like a big walk. Uh, so that's all been good uh coot update everything's fine coots outside are uh a little bit noisy but not too bad i think because there's no other coots near them so they've kind of got the rule of the roost really so that so they're less noisy and also it's not mating season so they don't seem to be that problematic about it but i do have a heron that sometimes sits on my roof on my roof and he's kind of peeping over uh uh into the canal looking for fish which is always nice to see. That's nice. I like I like herons because he kind of you, sometimes you don't think you've seen them because they're kind of they're very still and very silent and even though they're grey they kind of blend in and because they're not moving that's you know I think that's that's part of you part of uh, you, 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 how you see things as if something moves then your eye goes f- f- switches towards it but because uh, herons don't move deliberately because they're keeping an eye on the fish. Um, therefore it's hard to see them sometimes uh what else is going on uh uh, still not moving obviously we're in lockdown so the boats aren't moving anywhere uh the uh the the the, uh, canal and river trust who run the waterways uh, haven't really said don't move uh because obviously they they gave us a rebate on our license of a month with the first lockdown uh when they said okay don't move you don't have to move so they gave us a month's rebate and now they don't want to um now they don't want to give us a rebate so they've basically said move if you have to but you really don't have to we won't be monitoring it uh i think that's because because we're actually because it's winter and they have people i worked this out the other day because a lot of people winter more which means you can buy instead of having to move every two weeks you can buy uh, a license to more i i more up either in a winter area or anywhere on the towpath but you don't have to move uh, and you can do that from i think it's the end of october till like uh, march which some people do but i just oh, it's, a, it's a, a lot of money it's a waste of money and i know that they don't want to give a, a discount a, a refund for that or a, a little discount so so they've said to everyone you, you don't have to move we're not going to monitor it but you move if you want to so uh yeah so um i am elsewhere i'm in a place which is fine it's it's all right it's nice and quiet uh it's it's good because outside it's quite muddy so a lot of people d- tend not to come past you know you tend not to get people going on walks you know prams and bikes and all that people tend to come along and go oh this is horrible and then they move away so but i quite like it because it's uh i've got me uh we've got me big boots on and i'm near kind of nice places to go for walks so every day i'll make sure i do my ten thousand steps uh or as yesterday most days it's 17 17,000 yeah that would be right 17,000 or for this episode of Murder Mile I did 30, 36,000 steps oh dear that was just to get all the all the pictures and uh, all that uh, for the research for this so that was uh, we'll get to that in a bit anyway what else is going on I, 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 oh excitement to bought a new mattress that was exciting I've never bought a new mattress the old I, I was using the old one that was already on the boat uh it was one of the old ones it was sp- it was a sprung mattress with the kind of the the yeah the metal springs inside i'm gonna open a window a bit or some curtains um um it was horrible it was uneven it was um uh some of the springs were digging into my back and i kind of uh, i put pillows on it to try and cover it and it was really uncomfortable uh 
And you're probably thinking, get a mattress, get a new mattress then. But the problem is, if you live at home in a house and it's fine. All you've got to do is just call someone up and go, okay, oh, I want a mattress. And they'll go, okay, we'll deliver it today. If you live on a boat and you have no fixed abode, you are screwed because no one is going to deliver a mattress. And especially during lockdown as well. Uh, and uh, so I couldn't rent a car. Uh, it, was, it was just impossible. I just thought I, there's no way I can get a mattress. Um, do you know there's nowhere near? I, I couldn't carry one. And then I realised that there was a, a, a shop nearby which I normally wouldn't assume would sell furniture. But I just thought let's let's go on the website and have a look. And I browsed and I was like, oh, wow, they do loads of mattresses. So I got one in my size, and I thought, okay. I measured it and I was like, I'm, I'm uh, just under 300 steps from the shop and they're doing click and collect, which is good. So I thought, oh, well, let's do it. Let's let's spend 200 quid on a nice memory foam mattress. Oh, lovely, nice memory foam mattress. Uh, I measured it. It was fine. And then I turned up and I was, I, was, I was getting ready to work out whether I carry it on my head with both hands or, you know, and I'd worked out all the places I could put the mattress down because I was expecting it because it's a, a small double, I think. Yeah. Um, and I thought just enough space for me and Eva. Um, and well, mostly Eva, I have to sleep on the floor, on the floor at her feet, uh, which which is to be expected. Um, and carrying it, I, I thought, you know, I've got enough spaces along the canal where I can kind of put it down, have a bit of a breather, pick it back up because it's going to be heavy. And then when I got there, um, the lady delivered it, uh, put it out, and I was like, oh no no no, I didn't order a duvet because it was a small rolled up thing. I went, I didn't order a duvet, I ordered a mattress. I was expecting a big square thing. She went, no, that is it. And I looked and I was like, she was right. I thought, oh, okay, let's give it a go. Uh, and I took it home. I, I've ne- I'd never tried memory foam before. And it was great. You cut it open. And then all of a sudden it starts filling with air. And, and, pfft, and it went from this roll to something that was the right, the right size, but wasn't the right thickness. But I thought, well, it's filling up. It's doing its thing. And it let, it, instructions were on there. It said, don't touch it for 24 hours. Leave it in a warm room. So I did that and I put it there. And it got really big and fat. And I was oh, looking forward to that. But then I realised the next day, I can't get rid of my old mattress because, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, uh, the 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 Canal River Trust they they provide places we can get rid of rubbish, but you can't get rid of uh, mattresses there. Anything too big and bulky, and I can't take it to the council tip because you need to take it in a car, and I don't have a car, and you can't put it in a in a taxi, and it's a real pain in the ass to get rid of. Uh, and I'm not one of the, I'm not one of these people who like will dump things and hope for the best. I think people are the absolute scum of the earth. Uh, so I thought to myself, mm, what am I going to do? So what I did was I put the old mattress underneath the new mattress, and I looked at it and I thought, oh, is that is that ooh, is that going well? Is it doing it right? Because it's weird. All of a sudden, the, my mattress was now higher than my waist. It's probably just above belly button high, which is pretty pretty high, which means I've got to kind of skip and a jump to get up onto my bed. But when I got up on there, it was really good because what you've got now is the old sprung mattress, which has got a bit of a give, give and roll in it. But on top, you've got a firmer mattress that when you lie in, and then the memory foam kicks in and it kind of nestles you in. So it's great. I'm, I'm having some really good sleeps at the moment, which is nice. So that was 200 quid well spent. Normally, I don't treat myself um, with things. But that, I thought, sometimes you've got to, haven't you? So that was exciting. I cleaned my curtains. That was exciting. Uh, I went to take them all to the dry cleaners. And the, the man was like, it'll be 150 quid. And I was like, I was like F you. F you. 150 quid to clean all my curtains. So I took them all down. I went. I went to the local laundrette. I put them on a low cycle, and I did them all for about fifteen quid. And they looked great, and they didn't need ironing because I I dried them slowly in front of the fire. So there we go. All looks good. So they, yeah, happy with that because they were looking a bit tatty. What else have we got? Oh, it's my birthday today. How exciting! Happy birthday, me. Forty-five today, or as I like to say, each half of me is twenty-two and a half. Uh, and a little bit in the centre. Uh, so that's it. That's exciting. Uh, uh, I've got some some presents down, which I haven't opened yet. I think I'll open them tonight. Uh, that'll be my treat, and I will treat myself to something nice. Um, 
you're probably thinking at this moment, where is his uh, cake that he always has? Oh, shit, my tea. See, I told you. I told you I'd forget. Um, and I've left the tea bag in. So it's gone. That's good. It's stewed. Nice. Is it cold? Mm. No, it's all right. It's tepid. Oh, it started to rain. Good. So, uh, now I haven't got a cake uh, because I'm obviously on my diet. So uh, I might have one later on. I might treat me. I bought, I did treat myself to a Belgian bun the other day and I saved it. I put it in my bread box and I was like, oh, I'll eat it this morning in the morning when I'm working, when I'm writing, writing this. I didn't realize the bread box had got a bit hot. It was on its side and all of the icing had slipped off. Lovely. So, um, what else is going on? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, you will have heard me just mention walk with me um this is a new thing i'm doing obviously uh w with murder mile being offline uh I, I i hadn't really got a lot to post for my patreon subscribers and everyone's always very patient on there do you know i'm not posting a lot when when we're off but do you know people people are still pay still paying the same amount of money so what i decided to do i thought well let's do something do something different you know people seem to like extra mile in the waffly bit so i thought well let's do walk with me i go on a walk every day so i thought let's do walk with me so i've got a little roving mic that i had I, I clipped to my uh uh my jumper or my cardi or whatever and then I'm, as i'm about to do a walk I, I i pop it on and we do a little bit of a chat so i kind of fill people in on what i'm doing with the episode coming up so actually all the patreon subscribers know all of the episodes i've already researched i haven't told them all the details but they they've pretty much been filled in on on the the research methods i was doing and that's what walk with me is it's kind of every week i do a little bit of a walk you get an update on the episode coming up i feel you i i've I, my plan is to record it after i've edited each episode so you get it on a saturday uh it's been it's been uh available to everyone who's a patreon subscriber but because there was a bit of a gap between three dollars and ten dollars uh and everyone was like there's a bit of a jump there. I decided to set up a seven dollar tier, a uh, tier which is five, just five dollars a month, and for that you get all your extra mile goodies. So you get uh, all the crime scene photos, or a lot of stuff that no one will ever see. Lots of extra videos. Uh, you get uh, a weekly ebook uh, with the unedited script, and uh, for seven dollars a month or above. Uh, you will every uh, I think it'll be Saturday you'll get walk with me so uh, if you like waffle um, that's that's going to be your 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 extra stuff so uh, that's on Patreon so uh, uh, click on the show notes uh, if you want to enjoy that or if you're already a Patreon subscriber and you 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 you're paying you three dollars a month if you go, if you go to seven you'll get you get walk with me as well uh, and I was thinking about this while I was recording because there was a Glaxo Smith Klein, Glax, Glaxo Smith Klein. Yeah, I was trying to say that during the recording, and then I realised I couldn't say it. And I realised that you know sometimes people like the fact that I can't pronounce. Do you know, it's sad when I, when you listen to the episode, it, you're probably thinking, oh, it, you know, he, he's probably did that in one take. It's not. It's hours of me struggling. So, uh, and I was really struggling to say the words Glax. Glaxo Smith Klein. You try and put that into a sentence. I think I think the words were uh she was caught on a CCTV camera by Glaxo Smith see a fucking stupid name. Why don't you just call it Glaxo why don't you just call it Klein? She was caught by Klein. Yeah, that makes more sense. Stupid Glax Glax it's that first bit. Glaxo Smith Klein. Stupid idiots anyway so uh so the, i realized there was a lot of outtakes in there so what i'm going to do on patreon now the uh, patron uh subscribers i might use this as something uh because i need to make the tiers different so uh, i i don't know maybe this might be a ten dollar tier thing um uh, extras i don't know i need i need, you know, I need to think about that uh because people who don't like extras uh, might not like this, so I don't know. Um, right, we'll see. Uh, anyway, the re research has gone well. Uh, what I did was I gave myself a couple of days off. Obviously, uh, the archives are still shut. The archives are going to be shut for a long time. Uh, I did try and get into the National Archives pre-Christmas, uh, 
but the problem is they'd instead of allowing a lot of people into the reading room which i think holds around 200 people they'd limited it quite rightly to about 25 and then they'd they'd limited the amount of time you can use the archive for rightly because it doesn't have open windows and it has recycled air they'd limited it down to i think it was like 11 till 2 or something like that it wasn't long and it and they've got a new complicated booking procedure through an external website which is bloody atrocious anyway if anyone works for national archives please just your old system was fantastic where you could do it now you've got to go to eventbrite or something like that and that is a piece of shit i'm sorry it's absolutely horrible oh please change that system i don't know why you Ugh. anyway uh so i couldn't get into the archives when when i tried to we went we went into tier four so it was shut down so and i'm not going to get in there so um uh i'd i'd already kind of got uh, lots of episodes kind of like the alice gross one uh that i've been thinking about for ages and thinking one day i'll do those well now was the time so what i've done uh over the last couple of months i've done all my research for those cases and i've put them into what i call my little bible so it's basically uh I put everything into a chron chronological order. I have all the research to do with uh, the victim and the culprit. And then I know what everyone was doing at what time. And I've kind of got timelines p pieced together and all that, which which makes it really useful. So the Alice Gross one was really difficult because it was um, a lot of the... Because uh, this is all from press reports and things like that. A lot of the press got the got the got the details wrong. So which is why I've done a lot of the walking myself and walking the route and really trying to learn Alice's speed, which which was easy because she was caught on different cameras. So you can see that when she's on the road, she's walking at a more steady three and a half miles an hour. But when she gets to the towpath, and especially the bits where it's a little bit more uncertain, she's uh, she drops down to three miles an hour, which makes sense because it, it is bloody precarious there. It really is. So, um, so that's all done. So I've done all my research up until, uh, for the episodes up until July. And then... Uh, we will be doing the uh, a three-parter called New Blue, as mentioned, with uh, Police Constable Arsenal Guinness and the Metropolitan Pilot. Um, so I will be getting in touch with uh, Guinness hopefully soon, and we'll, we'll book that in. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be that'll be a nice chat. That will be. Uh, and then there'll be uh, another batch of new cases that I'm already kind of I've already planned. Uh, I just need to sit down and research, so I'll do those in the evenings uh, after I've done all these. Uh, and then we will do a little bit of mini mile or meander mile. I'm not too sure. Uh, and then I've already started researching this one. This is a big multi part at the end, end of the year. I think that's going to be an eight parter. Uh, it's a case that uh, some people have covered before, but they only do uh, like a one episode deal on that because there's not enough information out there, and people are kind of like, oh, do you know, uh, I'll just go to Wikipedia and I'll just, oh, there's an article in the Daily Mail, I'll just nick that. But if you if you really really dig deep, there's a lot of information out there that you can you can find. You just need to do the work, and I think that's the problem is most people don't want to do the work. So, uh, uh, but I'm happy with that. I'm happy to, you know. Uh, they, this it's a serial killer case, and uh, you know I'm going to open with uh, a case that they they, uh, they believe is him, uh, but he's never been charged with it. So uh, there's some interesting things that I think I think need to be brought forward. Um, uh, one other thing, so uh, da, 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 so Adam at uh, UK True Crime, uh, I'm going to read this for him. I, I promised him I'd do this. So this is his text. I'm going to read this now. Uh, are you a true crime uh, slash true crime fiction published author or aspiring author? Today, along with Catherine Skeet Jaffe, uh, I am launching a book publishing business called Crime Publishing Network. Uh, as the name suggests, we specialise in true crime and crime fiction only. If you are already a published author, uh, we will do all we can to get you a better deal uh, than the one you currently have. And we'll ensure you receive the personal treatment you deserve. If you are yet to publish a book, if you contact us with your ideas, we won't leave you waiting. You will always get a response within four weeks. Let's talk. 
So uh, it's a new thing that Adam and Catherine have set up. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Have a look at that. And also uh, Adam's doing a lot of uh, online chats every Thursday. They're free chats with people like authors or detectives and podcasters. And I think on week four or five, 25th of March or something, uh, I'm doing one as well. So uh, that'll be good fun. So um, I'm going to pop a a link to that in the show notes. uh, So you can do that. Crime con, uh, Jissy. No, there's a new possible date. Obviously, things are still still up in the air with COVID and things like that. Rightly, because we shouldn't be rushing back to having entertainment too soon. I know people want to have. Oh, want to have a holiday? I deserve a holiday abroad. Um, I, I think rightly we need to we need to play this safe rather than being dickheads about it. So, Crime Con, currently it's on the twelfth to the thirteenth of June, but. Uh, if you have already bought tickets, they will have already notified you about this. But if you haven't, this is for you. They've penciled in a second date, which is the 25th and 26th of September. Because obviously we still don't know whether uh, we will be able to do travelling and things like that. And whether we'll be able to meet in places until then. I, I know like Glastonbury has already been uh, cancelled and things like that. So it makes sense. So they've got a second date, 25th and 26th of September. Uh, that's their backup date. Uh, so... Uh, if 12th to 13th of June doesn't work, at least you know you've got that one. And don't forget, all of the tickets come with the, the COVID refund. So if it does get cancelled, you get a full refund. Um, as always, as mentioned before, there's more than 50 hours of true crime entertainment there. You get to meet lots of detectives and crime profilers and authors, as well as podcasters. Uh, I will be there. And lots of the people you know from uh, from uh, the world of podcasting. Ooh, so that'll be good fun. Uh, if you use the offer code MILE, you will get 10% off. Whew, right. Uh, I'm not going to say much about this case, to be honest. Uh, as mentioned, I did 30, 36,000 steps to cover the distance, which was to get down to the kind of the area oh where Alice is walking and I walked her route as well I think that's really useful to walk the route and kind of get an idea of what it's about and therefore I got there I could photograph everything I'll post some of them on social media but if you if you go to Patreon you get all the photos I've just done the first batch for the first episode and there's a lot I've done photos of Alice and her family I've done photos of all the locations that we visit so you can get an idea of it and i've also done you a very handy map as well so you can look at it you can you can watch you can look at the map because you can see where she's walked so i've done a, her route south and then her route north and then i've pinpointed where all the cctv cameras are and i've put photos next to uh, all of the locations as well so that's really good um but there's some it's 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 a it's a really interesting place to walk it's like um the the Uxbridge road bit is is fine and all that but when you turn onto the canal that's interesting because it's like the first it's it's called three bridges and I've, i'll probably edit this out of the episode because i think it ruins the start a little bit but three bridges is one of these places that people just walk past all the time and they just ignore it they just think it's part of the canal but it's uh isambard kingdom brunel's his last construction project and it's it's very much maligned, but it's it's fascinating to look at. It's a, it's a it's a point where uh, a train line, a road, and a canal intersect. Then normally what you do is you you kind of you'd either have the uh, the train going over the uh, road or over the canal or you know the the you know one or the other but they at this point unfortunately you got three things interconnecting and you could you couldn't really deviate them and you know the canals just at the top of the hill and it's about to go down so uh he did something that had never been done before what he did was um he had the canal there with the road going over the canal but then he put he put the canal on slightly on a bridge and therefore the train goes underneath so when you look at the intersection it's all of a sudden you're like oh shit that's weird you've got a train going underneath the canal which is underneath the road so that's why it's called three bridges that's quite interesting um and when you go down the canal instantly on your left hand side is a really long wall and that is the back of the old hanwell asylum uh which is as mentioned in those the old ealing hospital and you know there's some interesting they've tried to keep the old 
bits in there so they've still got the uh the old entrance and exit to the old asylum as well as the fire door from the um asylum as well so that's that's pretty interesting um but when you when you get down to uh lock 97 which is the key place on here that took me that took that took me about a day maybe maybe a day and a half to find that location because when you look at the the coverage of uh, uh the alice gross case most journalists didn't visit the location at all most you know as they do just sat on their ass and uh got the press report and you know took details from that fudged the rest and didn't do very much in relation to the details as they don't so um a lot of the press reports they 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 literally just say on the Grand Union Canal, or they go in Ealing, and Ealing is a borough, it's huge, so I was like, well, where is this location, and uh, what I was able to do, because they, they never mentioned any points on the canal where it was, it was it was rare if they did, and uh, if they did, quite often they got it wrong, so I actually found some photographs, um, and I did my usual thing that I, I, I do, I get the photographs, and I, I think there, there was a little white cottage on there, and I realised it was close to uh it was close to one of the locks and there's about there's seven locks in the handwell flight but in total from uh south or right down i think there's like 11 um so i i, I did my google map and i went down the canal slowly but slowly trying to find and i weirdly tried to find this exact location and weirdly i've walked that canal many times and many times i've walked past the little pathway at the back of lock cottage at lock 97 and I've, I've looked in and i've always thought to myself this looks it, it looks odd it looks unusual there's something about it i never liked and when i found that it was that location i was like shit that's weird um so that's how i found that location and and and, and weirdly when i went there walking on sunday i'd entirely forgotten that it was alice's 21st birthday so when i got there there was a, a little I think the family had put a little memorial up and, and something like that. So I did a little bit of filming there quickly, but then I buggered off as quickly as I could because the last thing you want to be doing is filming a little video for Murder Mile and then have the family turn up. So uh, so there was that. Um, yeah, not gonna, and I'm not, I'm not going to explain to... No, I'm not going to... Uh, let, let's wait until next week and then I'll fill you in with all the details that I did and didn't add to the case for that. So cool anyway i've waffled on too long um that was that i hope you enjoyed uh that episode of murder mile that was part one of the yellow ribbons of hanwell we got a uh, part two the concluding part next week uh as mentioned if you want to know more check out walk walk with me on patreon all oh, very good lots of goodies and uh that's all good so cool i'm gonna go and i would say enjoy my birthday but i'm gonna be editing today editing today editing tomorrow back more editing saturday and then i might give myself uh, oh, a little bit of time off on sunday i think yeah we're back into that routine anyway hope you all enjoyed that that was all good uh stay safe be good and uh, i hope to hear from you all soon be good lots of love bye bye